imagine uh, a kindergarten or first or second grade student or kid uh, thinking critically or trying for even for us to even try to think uh, uh, in that ma manner would be very difficult. But it's something that we would all like to uh, develop in the children. Uh, and there are many reasons for it, and that's what we will look at as well. So I'd like to start off the session by, uh, in the next hour, I don't know, maybe it will be 45 minutes to an hour. I want to, or I would like to have, first of all, your ideas and your thoughts on what you think critical thinking is, and it could be anything. So we first put down what would you think and what your ideas are in terms of critical thinking, uh, not only in education, but generally. What is critical thinking? What do you as an educator think critical thinking is? So I'd like to first start off with your ideas. Any any words that you think? My handwriting is terrible, and I must apologize for it. It's always been like that. So uh, I'm trying to improve it. And I did see that you have something here which says um, handwriting and calligraphy. <laughs> and it says that uh, good handwriting is a mark of success, confidence, and personality. So OK, if I think critically, uh, I'm, I'm none of those, OK? Confidence nor success, but my handwriting has always been very bad. I try, I really try very hard, but it doesn't, my students know it, and they accept it, and they can they sooner or later manage. So, um, what do you think critical thinking is? What is your idea of it? Any words that you think it is? Reasoning. Very good. Reasoning, yes. What else? Brainstorming. Yes. Brainstorming. Analyzing. Brainstorming, analyzing, broader perspective, broader perspective, broader, broaden your perspective, yes, a broader perspective, very good. What else? Decision making, problem yes. solving, yes. Okay. Yes. Problem, solving. Yeah. problem solving, solving problems. Decision making a little bit, trying to make decisions, right? Anything else? What else? Anything very different. This is probably the most logical things we would think of. As an educator, what do you think critical thinking is or could focus on or would cover? Yes? I'm integration. Very good. Yes, that's different. Integration. Integration of learning materials, knowledge, yes. and making the right connections. Very good, absolutely. What else? Does it involve any other skills apart from thinking and academic? Creativity. Very good, absolutely. Creativity, because you, in order to be able to think critically, you also need to have a creative bent of mind. And that is why art and creativity is so important in curriculum in schools because it develops another kind of thinking. Absolutely. Very good. Okay. Yes. Any others? Any other uh, ideas? Okay. So we have some good good thoughts here. Let's <clears throat> let's have a look and see what are the different words we can put down in terms of critical thinking. There are a lot of areas that we can attribute or attributes we say belong to a critical thinker. Okay? And that is what we want our students to be and why we want them to be critical thinkers as well we will come to. Asking pertinent questions. I think that is very, very important. Okay, the right kind of questions, first thinking and then answering. I did notice in your classes, and I've observed a lot of sessions, almost 10 sessions, I think, here, and I did see that some students asked very, very intelligent questions. I was amazed, really, truly amazed that some, I think it was in your science class one day, where a student asked something about cactus and the, the water, and I was really amazed that the child could think in that manner and ask question. Very good. So that person is asking pertinent questions and that's what we must try to encourage our students to do. Not illogical, irrelevant uh, questions or questions that are just asked for the sake of, sake of asking, just to be part of participation. Okay? Curiosity. Of course, it is a big element. I think being curious. If we are not curious, then we don't learn. Okay? Um, evaluating statements and arguments. Obviously, this comes at higher levels a little bit. Being able to evaluate, evaluation. We do know, to start off with, we're looking at knowledge as a basic skill, memorizing, looking at basic knowledge skills. Then we move a little bit into analysis, synthesis, and higher, higher order skills where they're looking at uh, uh, critical thinking. Okay, so we are leading towards that. It's a step-by-step -step pyramid, if you wish. You don't just suddenly start with critical thinking, okay? 
Uh, problem solving, yes, and we put that down a bit, yeah, problem solving, trying to solve problems in their own way, thinking of ways, other ways in which they can solve problems, not necessarily the direct or the most obvious way of solving a problem. Seeking new solutions, definitely, again, that's also part of problem solving in different ways. Distinguishing between facts and opinions. This becomes very important in higher education. What is a fact and what is an opinion? Okay, very often students write, and in, in school we teach them to write essays and opinions about what they, th what they believe, they think, and so on. But as they move on into higher education later on, or they're becoming professionals, uh, the emphasis on opinion goes down, and more of factual knowledge. It's very, very important. Okay? So why? Who said that? You know, where is this from? Is this really true? I even ask my students to question the textbook, because even sometimes not reading textbooks, you know, are not really uh, economics. Look at all the theories we've had in economics, that, and still we have the least problem that's taking place, you know. So you're constantly questioning, is a theory really a theory? And that is what we mean by critical thinking. Seeking proof, of course, proof of whatever it is you're stating, whether it's a theory or a fact and so on. Seeking evidence to support your arguments. Admitting a lack of knowledge and understanding. Now you're seeing different skills coming in here, uh, where it's more person, uh, psychological, emotional. It's not necessarily related to the brain and to thinking. So brain is is uh, is matter, it's, but what you do with the brain is essentially what we're looking at. But again, there is a psychological aspect of critical thinking as well. And that is admitting your lack of knowledge, saying that you are wrong, saying I don't understand. When I was again in the math class, I was impressed when one of the young boys said, but I don't understand this, I, I, I don't get it, why? If it's, this is how it should, and that is a very, very positive step towards critical thinking. He's not afraid to say that he doesn't understand, and I think that's very good. And that is what we should encourage as well. Being reflective, and we've talked about that, I spoke about this with students as well, some of them came to me today and said, I remember all that you talked about and I'm trying to do it and so on, so I think that's very positive. Seeking clarity and exactness, yes, being precise, exact, and being very clear. We are all constantly seeking clarity. Uh, some interesting ones here I think are careful and active observer, yes, uh, humility. I think this is very, very important, and I think in our culture, uh, and that's something we are fortunate to have uh, in our culture. We, we are naturally, uh, we have humility. So that, I think, is a very positive aspect of learning and being a critical thinker, which you probably may not see in other cultures. But again, arrogance does not necessarily mean that you're not a critical thinker, but definitely being humble or humility does uh, show that you're a lifelong learner and that you're not always right. Uh, sees critical thinking as a lifelong process of self-assessment. This is something that is, it's a lifelong learning and uh, teaching process. Okay, So these are some attributes of a critical thinker. And I think if you try to see that in your students, or you try to think of it yourself as well, uh, it might uh, be very valuable. So if you're looking really at a kind of, not really a model, I think uh, there are many models of critical thinking. This is one of them. Uh, if we talk about the main aspects, the main four areas of importance in, in critical thinking, they could be, and these are big words, and very often we don't even understand these words. I can be, uh, I guarantee you that a lot of people don't know what inference is and, and so on. So what is inference, inferring something, okay? Um, what, 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 how does that have to do with critical thinking? When you infer, what is to infer? And very often we are ask our students, or our students would infer something. What would that mean? Deduce. Very good. Absolutely. That's the right, perfect uh, meaning of, of uh, inferring. Given a set of facts or, or uh, data, you are inferring. It's part of research. It's a research process as well. You okay? have certain hypotheses, and you have uh, you make a deduction, and through deductive theory, you infer. Okay. So that is inference, and that is a part of critical thinking. You take a set of information and you derive conclusions from it through inferring. Explanation is a very simple form of critical thinking, and that is what we all do as educators. That's probably one of the most basic. So you explain things, and you explain it, and that's it. Okay, And then you stop there because you think, I've explained it 10 times. The student should get it now. Why doesn't he get it? And I do that in economics, and I'm not. Sometimes I wonder why are they getting it? You have to explain it four or five times. 
But then I realized that it is because I'm only explaining it. And when you go beyond the explanation and you move into other areas, because very often students don't get it when we explain it, or they don't get the way we explain it. So we need to find out how we can explain it to this particular student. That's a little, it requires knowing the student, it requires time, it requires a little effort, and I'm sure, you know, it's possible. It's possible, even when you have large numbers, and you don't have that here, you've got really good numbers in your classrooms. Uh, in one semester, I had 220 students, and that was really, really hard to, to manage. But uh, this is very manageable, and I'm sure you can reach that level of understanding with your students. Uh, then there's, of course, evaluation. It's a very important part of critical thinking, where they are evaluating a certain idea, concept, ideology, philosophy, uh, model, uh, theory, whatever. Okay, they are evaluating. This is a high order thinking skill. It should be there in 7th, 8th, 9th, and 10th grades, I believe. It should definitely be there. And I'm sure it is there. I've seen that in some of your curriculum as well. Uh, but it needs to be reinforced constantly in the classroom. You, if a student asks you something, you can turn the question back and say, but why are you asking this? Uh, what is the reason for your uh, analysis? What, why do you have this opinion? Or why do you make this statement? Okay? And that is essentially putting them into an evaluated mode. That, that is a help, very helpful tool. Self-regulation. When we talk about self-regulation in critical thinking, we understand our limits. We know what our limits are. We know how to regulate our own learning. And that understanding is part of the education as well. And students should develop that in seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth grades. They should have that. They are able to regulate their own learning, understanding, and so on. Okay. And interpretation, of course, is important. When you interpret, what do you do? What are we doing? Here, there is a bit of a interpretation is not so so strong as inference. Why? Inferring something is much more solid, it's probably more scientific, but interpretation <coughs> is a little different. Why? You're interpreting something. In more opinion based? Yes, absolutely. Very good. It's much more <coughs> opinion based. In, uh, when you're trying to interpret, it is your interpretation, maybe different from mine, maybe different from yours, and so on. Okay? So there is an element of subjectivity, but that's not wrong. Okay? Subjectivity is good in critical thinking. It does not all have to be. Uh, clear cut, right and wrong, like mathematics. So critical thinking does have a lot of interpretation and some opinion and subjectivity. And finally, analysis. These are important elements. And uh, analyzing something is maybe taking it apart and analyzing it, or analyzing it as a whole. So you can analyze a concept or a theory as a macro, meaning the whole. So it could be, let's say, let's take as an example, since I was in your class, the nitrogen cycle. Okay. If you were to analyze the nitrogen cycle, you would look at it as a holistic whole, as a cycle. Or you could break it up, split it up into the various elements, and analyze it in that form as well. But it's up to the student to understand, and you to push the student to understand that it is a whole as a cycle. What if one of the elements of that cycle were not there, or did not happen as it should, or that is when they start thinking. Okay? So if this were not there, then what would happen to the nitrogen cycle and so on? Okay, that is really analysis. And going into that analysis is something we should be as well moving into at a higher stage. Okay, let's look at some types of thinking. The reason we need to understand this is because different students think differently. And I saw that even in the pre-kindergarten class, in the pre k class, uh, where I saw that one of the students was very distracted. And this teacher asked me to come and listen and to have a look at being the students. He was not listening to anything. He was running around. Of course, they're three-year-olds, four-year-olds, and whatever. And he was just doing his own thing. And so she said, you know, uh, whatever. Have a look and see what we can do. So I watched him, and I observed him, and I tried to sit with him, and I tried to give him instructions and talk to him. Nothing was happening. He was in his own world. But he was intelligent. And that's normal for kids. They're distracted. The moment she took out, they were being creepy crawlies. That was the theme of the class, and they were being spiders and ants and whatever. The moment she, so she explained everything, she sang it, she did whatever she had to do really very well. But he was not listening. He was doing what he wanted. The moment she pulled out uh, the clay, there was clay, and she opened the clay, the box of clay, and she started making 
the, uh, the, uh, the spider, he had was rapt attention. He just sat there still and he was looking at her. He was so focused. I couldn't believe it. That four-year-old who was really running around all over. And he watched how she did it. She made the head, and she made the body, and she made the legs. He was just concentrated. I've not seen a child that focused. So it was amazing. And then I mentioned to her, I said, this learner or this child is a, is, is, is a uh, he learns by doing, or he's a much more, he learns through motor uh, actions and more that if you talk to him, if you talk to him for five hours, he won't hear you anything that you have to say. But the moment you do something, and that is why we need to, and uh, I think he got it, and then I tried to make him do it, but she said, now you have your own piece of play and make me a creepy crawly. So at first he was, you know, just fiddling with it, and he said, I'm making too puppy, and he made it all flat. He refused to do anything. Then I took a piece and I said, look, roll it like this to make a ball. And I showed him exactly how to do it. He did it so well, unbelievable. I gave him a piece and he rolled it into a perfect smooth circle. And I said, now this is the head and so on. So uh, there's a different way of, uh, of learning and teaching. Every child has that and we need to be able to see that. Some are scientific thinkers, very, you know, methodical, organized. They break things up, they have structure, and so on. And they're good in math, they're good in science, they're probably good in numbers, and so on. The creative thinkers are better in languages, art, and so on. Okay? They, they are, like to do things, they're very creative. But they can learn a tough scientific concept, or math, through creativity. Which is why the whole Montessori education was so popular some time ago, where kids learn math by doing. And I think that you have some very interesting math uh, way, uh, ways of learning as well. Then you have, uh, of course, uh, critical thinking. There are critical thinkers. Some learn very well through critical thinking, through asking questions, analyzing. You must notice in your class that you have students, probably, who ask a lot of questions. And just, but why teacher this? Or, but why not that? But last time you said this. No, I don't believe that. Do they challenge you ever? They do? They do? I like that. I find it very interesting when kids challenge their teachers and say, I don't believe that. I read something else. My mommy said this, or my daddy said this, and so on. And I think that is very interesting. Uh, at our level as well, they are challenging us. They have their laptops in front of us and say, no, but you know, and they're checking online and say, no, but this is not. So that is interesting as well. And those are the critical thinkers. Then you have the decision makers. Okay, they just want a decision or they want to know what is the end goal. What am I supposed to do? Just tell me what I have to do. I'm not interested in the rest. They want to see the end result. And I have seen a lot of such students. So what am I supposed to make? What do you want me to write in this paper? Just tell me what you want for this project. They're not interested in the process of learning. They don't want to analyze. They don't want to reflect, nothing. They want the end product to be done and be done with. And they do sometimes a pretty good, good job, easy job. And then you have the problem-solving thinkers. They are interested in finding solutions. Oh, this is not working. Let me fix it. Or let me put this right. Yes, absolutely. And that is a very interesting student as well. So if you know that these are the different learning uh, patterns of students, you can try to tailor make your, your learning and your strategies towards them. It, it's not that difficult. And you, you're lucky you have your students for a year. Uh, so you're with them for a year. So you have a lot of time to know them and to get to work with them. We don't. We have four or five months, and then our students move on, and we get new students. So I think it's nicer for you. You can really look at this in a better way. Why is it important? Why so much of emphasis on critical thinking these days in education all over the world? It's becoming so important. You know, we have the best students coming out of schools in, in Singapore and all of these areas. But when they come to the West or they are in an environment where they have to think critically, uh, we do find that they are not really up to the mark. They get excellent scores, they do very well, well in exams, but if you put them in a situation which requires some critical thinking, they uh, seem to have problems. So again, it's a matter of what skills you are developing in your education environment. Today, globally, since we're looking at our kids being the global future, we need to be, make them ready for this in some way. Okay? So we, we believe, of course, that we learn is to think. If you think poorly, then you're learning poorly. Okay? To think well is to learn well. So you are making them think well through critical thinking. Okay? All content to be learned must be intellectually constructed, yes. You must think about some strategy in, in terms of your, your delivery, your content, your structure, 
and so on, your assessments, etc. And of course, memorizing the savings number. Okay, because it, today, especially today, when it's your information is a, a mouse click away, why do you even need to memorize it? Okay, just for that exam, and then it's over. Whenever you need it, it's a mouse click away. I don't need to memorize any information. Okay. How many of you know the uh, phone numbers of your uh, family members? I don't. <laughs> That's something I stopped memorizing because we have smartphones and whatever. Because everything now is is digitized, and we don't memorize anything anymore. So. I think uh, that's an important factor we must consider. Our, our future is changing, our lives are changing in technology. So memorizing is becoming so unimportant. Of course, there are basic things we must memorize, but apart from that, it is critical thinking which makes you a, a successful student, learner or not. I think here uh, I've tried to put down some questions which, I, which could help you as teachers and as educators. Uh, to encourage critical thinking and to see whether you are practicing that or you're asking such questions or if your students are asking you irrelevant or silly questions, how can you direct it better? What can you ask them to make them think in a more critical way? You could just simply say, so what do you mean by whatever, okay, whatever they ask or say. It could be something absurd, but even uh, you could ask them, so what do you mean by it? Okay, that's a good starting point. Uh, how did you come to this conclusion? Okay, you say, no, but this is it, and I think it is this way, or shouldn't it be that way? No, how did you come to this conclusion? Is a good question to ask once in a while. Uh, probably more in, in subjects where uh, there is more discussion, debate, discourse, like languages, or, or even in science, or uh, uh, the, the natural sciences, histories and geographies, and so on. What was said in the text is something you could as well ask. Sometimes they oh, I read this, but teacher, I read that, and oh, you know, I saw this. So what was it? What really was in that text is what you could ask them. Uh, trying to get them to focus on really what the matter was, what was the content of that text, okay? What is the source of your information? Is it someone told me, my mom, mom said, or my dad said, or uh, I saw it on the newspapers, and so on, okay? What assumption led you to that conclusion? Okay, sometimes they may make um, biased or prejudiced statements. So then you can turn around and say, so what assumption led you to that conclusion? Why are you arriving at this conclusion? Why do you believe this? It's, is it true? Do you really think it's true? Who told you that? Where did you hear this? And so on. And really, really just keep questioning until you get to the bottom of what the real uh, uh, issue was. Okay, you'll be surprised at the things you will find uh, in that area. And just to give you a small example, a very little, um, a young learner or a young kid, my daughter, when she was uh, young in, in, in the kindergarten, she used to draw, the art teacher always said uh, when she told her to draw something, she would draw or go up going out to a fair or whatever. She once drew um, a balloon that flew away and she's standing and looking very sad, looking up at the balloon. So I said, well, is she okay? And I, you know, sometimes teachers get overly analytical, especially in the United States. And they were okay. I said, no, no, don't worry, she's fine. And then so I said, well, you know, once a, a, a balloon flew away, she was very sad, and she started to cry. So the teacher converted that into a very positive. She understood that's a sad emotion for her, and then you can't learn. If you're in a sad uh, emotional state, it's hard for you to learn. So she wanted to make it positive, so she asked my daughter, so uh, when that balloon flew away, what do you think, uh, who, who else would have had fun with it? Who could have enjoyed it? So then my daughter said, well, maybe the birds. So the next time in the drawing, she put a bird and she had the bird next to the balloon in the sky and that made my daughter very happy. And put her in the frame of mind to learn or to get into the mode of accepting knowledge or to listen and so on. That's another aspect we don't consider very often. If a student is troubled, or, uh, or sad, or emotionally in a state, they're not able to learn. And you make everything possible. Uh, but it, so you have to, as, as educators, try to put them in a state of mind that is happier, uh, where they come here and they feel, they just feel happy. Okay, so that is something that's important. As well, why did you make that inference? Is another one more consistent with the data? Of course, this comes again in the evaluative analytic aspect in science or in research and so on, but it's a why have you drawn this conclusion? Does the data support this conclusion? Why are you saying this? And so on. Uh, why did you make that inference? Is another one more consistent with the data? Why is this issue significant? 
sometimes we make statements or we are discussing things a lot in class, one topic maybe, one theme, and very often students don't understand the relevance of things. Why is this significant? Why am I learning this? Why am I wasting my time learning this? And um, students say, why do we have to learn algebra? You know, it's no use. Give me one good place where I can apply this algebra. Why am I doing it? If you are able to show them the relevance of what you are teaching and the matter and the content and how important it is, they will listen, they will learn. There's no doubt about it. So what we call, we call this contextual learning. And contextual learning is putting the content Putting the content into context. Okay, so you have content. We have a lot of material. We focus on improving ourselves in our content, but we don't focus on areas where we think I need to establish the context for this child or for the student. They need to understand why they're learning this. And if I had students as well, I don't need to learn economics. I want to be a hospitality or a marketing student, and why am I wasting my time? And it's too tough, and I don't like it. And then I really started off showing them the relevance of economics in any, any, any profession or uh, uh, daily lives. Okay? And that is when they realized, oops, yes, of course I must learn. There's, I told them there's no business school in the world that does not have economics in their curriculum. And why is that? Obviously because it's very, very important. So once you establish the, the, the context, then they are more receptive. I mean, it could be tough with algebra. I mean, frankly, I'm at a loss as well. I don't know. If I were an algebra teacher, it would be very hard for me to explain or establish that context with my students. How can I show them it's relevant to their future or to their lives or to their learning? Um, taking abstract concepts of X, Y, and Z and trying to make them understand why it's important for you is, is a little difficult. That is challenging. But otherwise, I think it is possible in any area. How do I know what you are saying is true is another question we could ask, okay? That is very, very challenging and sometimes students like to ask us that, you know, how do I know what you're saying is true or right or correct? And uh, that's something you could pose and ask your, your students as well once in a while. It challenges them to think. Then they get defensive or they start arguing. And that's nice too, sometimes, to get that argument going. How do I know what, that what you're saying is true? What, what is an alternative explanation for this phenomenon? So any alternative explanations are well, welcome. You should you know, uh, encourage that. And you should challenge their thinking. That is a very, very good way of making them think very quickly. Just challenge them. Which is why debates in the last few years have become such a very, very popular form of assessment. And we do debates as well. And I find that students really it's amazing how they can think on their feet and challenge each other with questions and carry on a debate, of course, at a higher level, uh, at a higher uh, age level. Uh, but I'm sure they can do that very well and successfully, even in six, seven, eight, nine, or ten weeks. They would uh, to take a topic and take something that's very controversial, maybe, and uh, we would just give it to them and say, these are the rules within these parameters. You have to set guidelines for young students. And then you have to take them on with it. So I think that is another area. Group learning and group teaching as well encourages critical thinking. If you listen to how they talk when they're working in a group, it's very interesting. And that is where the critical thinking process starts. They challenge each other, they argue with each other. But why do we have to do it this way? Let's do it the other way. I had a group of students who were discussing once about Apple, the brand, and it was a marketing project that they said you have to create a new brand. Uh, uh, and you can do it, uh, it can be a brand extension from a Coca-Cola or an Apple or whatever, or it could be an altogether new brand that you're creating and create a marketing plan. They wanted to create Apple hotels. Okay, so moving from technology and creating an Apple hotel or creating Apple hotels worldwide, and I was listening to that, I was at the, at the a photocopying machine and they were sitting in a group and talking about this and each one was challenging the other very, very, uh, intelligently about why we can can do this or cannot do this. And then they start thinking about the concept and so on. So I think uh, when they work in groups, they are at ease, they are more comfortable.